Alrighty guys, we're back for some Rakdos Dragons, and this is a Wilds of Eldraine Standard Brew. We're gonna go over the deck, then hop right into some ranked, but first things first, for anyone who may not know, I'm Red Cat and I play aggro decks and any decks with red in them as well, so I hope that sounds fun to ya. Also, we do got that Discord link as well as that relatively new Patreon link down in the description if you're interested in joining either of those up. Okay, what do we got packed into the build here? Decadent Dragon, a 4-mana four 4-4 four, four Flying Trample Dragon. Whenever it attacks, you create a treasure token. Nice, dude, but it also has that adventure side. Instant, instant speed, 3-mana. It's called Expensive Taste. Exile the top two cards of target opponent's library face down. You may look at and play those cards for as long as they remain exiled. Pretty cool looking card, guys. I think it's going to do a lot, especially in this deck, because we love to have dragons, so. <laughs> Godric Cloaked Reveler is a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three with haste. It is a legendary creature, which could come in handy in this deck. We have Celebration. As long as two or more non-land permanents enter the battlefield under your control this turn, then Godric Cloaked Reveler is a dragon with base power toughness 4-4. Four, four. It has flying and, for one red mana, dragons. You control, get plus one plus oh until end of turn. Beautiful, dude. Now, Godric loses all of their creature types, so uh, <laughs> I thought I'd finish reading the card there. Yeah, dude, buffing a relatively wide board state of dragons sounds decent. Or even if you're just buffing a couple dragons, that's still pretty good, dude. And we have a top end dragon here that pairs beautifully with Godric. Realm Scorcher Hellkite, six mana, four six, has flying and haste. It has bargain, so you may sacrifice an artifact, enchantment, or token as you cast this spell. And if it, when it enters the battlefield, if it was bargained, add four mana in any combination of colors. So what you could end up doing is you could play Realm Scorcher, uh, bargain it out, maybe, and grab just four red sources. Drop the Godric. Uh, the celebration goes off because that's the second permanent, non-land permanent, right? And then immediately use that last red mana that you got from that bargain. Uh, to buff both of the dragons. That is just huge damage, potentially, on turn 6. And in this deck, we do have a little bit of ramp, so maybe even before then, too. So while this is a mid-range build, we are really trying to pull off big damage in the early mid-game and close up the game before other mid-range builds actually get to pop off, right? So, yeah, I wouldn't call it aggro by any means, but early mid-game is the goal, and, like, Godric and stuff is going to help us achieve that, hopefully. Okay, more new cards. We got Virtue of Persistence here. Seven mana enchantment at the beginning of your upkeep. Put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. Okay, but it also has that adventure sorcery side for just two mana. Target creature gets minus three, minus three until end of turn. You gain two life. And I just want to say it again for myself. It is sorcery speed. <laughs> I don't want to accidentally keep this open thinking like it's a go for the throat or something. I mean, obviously it's not go for the throat, but you guys know what I mean. Okay, more new cards. Charming Scoundrel. Have you guys seen this card yet? <laughs> I feel like I shouldn't even go over it, but you know what? Two mana, one, one, rock and haste on the ETBs. You can either uh, discard a card, draw a card, or create a treasure token. Nice. Or create a wicked roll token attached to target creature you control. The wicked roll is an aura. Chanted creature gets plus one, plus one. When that ore is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, each opponent loses one life. Charming Scoundrel has been terrific so far. And in a deck like this that doesn't mind that treasure ramp, yeah, sounds relatively solid, dude. Okay, more new cards. Torch the Tower. It's a one mana instant speed rock and bargain. Torch the Tower deals two damage to target creature or planeswalker. If it was bargained, however, it does three damage to that permanent instead, and you get to scry one. Nice. And if a permanent dealt damage by it, Torch the Tower would die this turn, exile it instead, which comes in handy way more often than you would ever expect, right? So really like this card. Uh, seems to be solid, dude. And we do have some artifacts packed in here for the bargains. I don't know how often we're going to actually bargain out with the artifacts over like our treasure tokens, but you never know. We have the Iron Craig, which is a two mana legendary artifact. You can tap it for a colorless. And whenever a legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may have the Iron Craig become a legendary equipment artifact named Everflame Hero's Legacy. If you do, it gains equip 3, and equip creature gets plus 3, plus 3, and then the Iron Craig loses all other abilities. Yeah, you never know when we're actually going to use that bottom ability, but in a deck like this, I think we're just treating it as a really solid mana rock 
for the early games is that little bit of extra ramp could go a very long way, huh? Okay, I think that's all the new cards already, guys. So let's keep going over what else is in the build, huh? We got all four Shivan Devastators. X and a red, zero, zero, flying haste when it ETBs. It comes in with X plus one, plus one counters on it. Very solid dragon, dude. Got all four Invasion of Tarkir, two mana battle siege with five defense counters. When it ETBs, reveal any number of dragon cards in your hand. When you do Invasion of Tarkir, it deals X plus two to any other target where X is the number of cards revealed this way. Honestly, could be pretty solid damage early on. There's a possibility where you play this out on two, reveal three dragons, and just immediately hit your opponent's face for five damage or something ridiculous, right? Now, that being said, there's not that many dragons in here. There's uh, 15 total dragons. Uh, like, you know, Godric doesn't have the title of dragon until it actually gets that celebration ability going and stuff like that, so... I still think it's going to do a lot, and flipping this Battle Siege, it becomes pretty disgusting really fast. It, it's a must-deal with creature Defiant Thundermaws, a 4-4 four, four Flying Trample, and whenever a dragon you control attacks, it deals 2 damage to any target. Yeah, if that's not dealt with, dude, it's going to be over really, really fast. Rocking a single Celestis, uh, just, I love this card. It's on so many levels, it's so terrific. Um... <laughs> I don't have room for two, but usually if I do have two, I always say, like, it's totally fine. You could always just ditch the second one to the first one's ability. And yeah, the, the extra filter, the mana fixing, the uh, life gain, everything about this card is terrific for mid-range builds. I love it. Rivas of the Claw. This reminds me, guys, this was a suggestion down in the comments that if I actually did return to Rakdos Dragons to make sure to include the Rivas of the Claw. So thank you for the suggestion. I appreciate it. Uh, three mana, three, three, rock and menace. It is a legendary creature. Unfortunately, in and of itself is not a dragon. Uh, makes me a little sad, but that's fine. Doesn't have to be because it has a very sick ability here. You can tap it at two mana in any combination of colors. Spend this mana only to cast dragon creature spells. Okay, so that already like that's pretty solid ramp, man. Just all in all, even if you're just using it for an extra two counters on a Shivan Devastator, that's still relatively solid. Now, once during each of your turns, you may cast a dragon spell from your graveyard. Whenever you cast a dragon spell from your graveyard, it gains when this creature dies, exile it. So yeah, we could potentially bring stuff back from the grave as, you know, we could ditch some late game dragons to try to find something else for the early game, like early game removal or something. Ditch those with the charming scoundrel and maybe eventually cast them back when we get the rivas down. So I don't know how often we actually want to do that, but you know, it's a it's a little thing in the build here. Have a single at sushi, the blazing sky, uh, excellent dragon overall. Those extra treasure tokens can really come in handy too. Junji, the midnight sky is a five mana five five flying menace, and when it dies, you get to choose one of these. You can either have each opponent discard two cards, lose two life, or put target non dragon, uh, non dragon creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. You lose two life. Just a relatively solid dragon, I would say. <laughs> Already went over the Realm Scorcher. Also on the top end, Tyrant of Kier Ridges is a 6 mana, 4, 5, flying. When it ETBs, it deals 4 damage to any target. You can immediately just ping the opponent's face then if you want. Uh, whatever you want to do with that 4, it's usually going to be removal though, I would say. Now, also has that bottom ability for a red mana. Tyrant of Kier Ridges gets plus 1, plus 0 until end of turn. Solid top end dragon, dude. Let me tell you what. The mana base, we got all the dual land from the cliffs to the ridge to the springs and then also rocking a Mirax too because, you know, it is like token generation for the bargain on Realm Scorcher and Torch the Tower and it could also be like early game mana fixing with that second ability there, add one mana of any color, activate only if Mirax entered the battlefield this turn. Just going to be a solid land overall, a couple Crucible of Defiance and a single abandoned Mire. Having a couple Crucible of Defiance is kind of the same concept as the Mirix. It's token generation that we can use for the Bargain on Torch and the Realm Scorcher. So overall, 25 total land, huh? Hopefully the legendaries on the Crucible of Defiance doesn't hold us up at all, but usually it doesn't when we only have two of them in here. And then, yeah, these legendary utility lands work well because, you know, Godric's legendary, Atsushi, and Junji are legendary, as well as the Rivas of the Claw, too, so... <laughs> Getting these relatively cheap could be easy. Honorable mentions, guys. I really wanted to go for the Colligan Warmonger again, because I think I only played with this card once, but I couldn't find room for it this time, huh? 
This is a three mana, three two. It has haste, and when it attacks, you look at the top six cards of your library. You may reveal a dragon card from among them, put it into your hand, put the rest in the bottom of your library in a random order. Or honestly, dude, like it seems pretty good, but for what we're trying to do in this deck, I guess not. And then in and of itself, it's not a dragon as well. And all of our other three drop cards are already non-dragons too. So what would we have cut for like one or two of these? I really don't know. And we don't want to cut any dragons because then all of a sudden that ability gets worse too. Just wanted to bring it up in the honorable mentions that I really, really wanted to play with this card. And this time I didn't add let go for the throw over here because I always say this, uh, your choice spot removal is totally fine. If you don't like the virtue of persistence, for example, with the adventure side, you could totally drop them, go up a couple, go for the throws. And same concept with porch the tower. Uh, your choice spot removal is totally fine. Uh, cut mine and go up yours, you know what I mean? Okay, guys, enough rambling, huh? Let's go ahead, take this into some ranked, and see how we do. Right into that first game, guys. Let's go. All right, what am I expecting from the build? I actually think it's going to be pretty good, man. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't be expecting too much, but... Ooh. E. I don't like this. I don't like this opening hand. To get treasure on Scoundrel, go into Rivas that way. It's probably going to die, though. No dragons. You know what? I'm going to give it a shot, dude. This is what we're here to do, man. We're here to test the limits of the build. Porch the tower is open for the opponent's turn here. Hitting like a tenacious underdog would be so good. Woohoo! <laughs> I felt it. I felt it in my bones. That underdog was dropping. Okay, no black source still, but that's totally fine. Charming Scoundrel, we're going to grab that treasure token. Ramp is good, but also going into Rivas of the Claw is excellent next turn. And if we do see a Black Source, maybe we ramp into a bigger, chunkier Devastator. Maybe not, though. Gix. Yogmoth Praetor. Yeah, I, I don't mind this. We, we let the Gix survive for a turn and just go into the Rivas, right? That's totally fine. Uh, we might have been able to cheese through the one damage. They might not have blocked in fear of like a play with fire, but I don't think they would have fallen for that. So like we still could. I'm just going to hold the scoundrel back. I, I don't think that's worth the risk, dude. Just losing scoundrel for no reason. Nice cut down for the scoundrel does not hit the rivas. Luckily, we see mana off the top. Oh, crap. <laughs> gonna say if we see mana off the top then we have the tyrant of cure ridges next turn but now we're gonna have to go ahead and find a black source here for the other rivas again yeah they doubled down on removal for that turn which happened to be pretty decent man we're gonna take out the gix to get rid of their card draw here and we're gonna keep the tyrant a secret and show them the devastator take out that gix and then Porch the Tower is available. No tokens on the board. Yeah, keeping a keeping a hand with two mountains. Oh, that is bad news bears, guys. Oh, buddy, that is bad news, huh? Maybe we start flying in. I mean, we don't want to just keep Torch open we start flying in at this invasion maybe we see like another devastator off the top um this is two damage to target creature or planeswalker it's not to anything so we can't just hit that invasion with the torch right definitely something to think about though maybe in the final thoughts we'll talk about how play with fires potentially could have been a little better swinging with that obliterator not there's just not a lot we can do against that obliterator dude there really isn't we might be able to get, like, a successful block if we get... Oh, Liliana. Oh, we got the Black Source, guys. Let's go. Okay. Rivas can come down. We have Torch the Tower, and we want to do this now. Now? Right? Yes. Now. Even though they, they only have Swamps. 
I don't want to get to the point where they get the plus one on this before I take it out or something. I guess we would have pool control on their turn too, but yeah, no, we're just taking it out now. Okay, Rivas, can you survive the turn, buddy? Because if so, Tyrant can come down. I don't think we're going to be able to outpace the Obliterator, though. This is a perfect example of a game where, yeah, your choice spot removal is totally fine, man. <gasps> no, Gix's command. Oh my goodness, dude. <laughs> How brutal. How brutal is this? So if we don't block next turn, we die. This does have trample. So not much we can do. However, there is a potential where we find a go for the throat from the opponent's deck here. So let's see it, huh? That would be wild, man. Two cards. Duress. Okay, well. Also, I guess there was a chance of seeing a swamp too, so... Um, I don't know why I got so excited that I actually hit something with the duress there. Good game upon it, good game. That obliterator was going to be nasty regardless. Even with the block, even if we would have been able to survive it another turn, the block, we would have been sacrificing four cards, including our lands too. So yeah, best bet, find removal for obliterator from the opponent's deck. That could have been really cool. Deck it in dragon, huh? Gotta keep our eye on this card, man. There's this alternate art for the Decadent Dragon that I might be using for the thumbnail, and I, both of the artworks are absolutely gorgeous, but there's something so like charming about that uh, alternate art that I just really enjoy. I, that might be the one I use for the thumbnail. It's, it's a shame that I don't have the artwork for the card. That way, you know, it matches the thumbnail, but either way, you guys might know the one I'm talking about. Well, obviously, especially if I used it as my thumbnail, right? <laughs> the thumbnail image would already be there, established. <laughs> Celestis, we actually have our black source this time, and we got removal. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of hope for that obliterator, dude. And so, depending on the meta you're seeing, I'll tell you what, I've been seeing a lot more obliterator recently, so... You never know, there might be a reason for the uptick in its amount of play so if we do end up seeing more cards like that or what's the other one the mono white one the vindicator or whatever all right guys i'm gonna go ahead and um pause the recording until the opponent shows up here okay the opponent didn't show up but it's letting us play so i'm gonna play and then we'll see if they show up this time huh <laughs> well we'll give them a second before i pause the recording again uh, I sometimes I get asked, why do I keep these matches in? And of course, it's because of the example hands. We don't get too many of these per video. And so keeping these hands in, I feel like it's kind of important. And like the couple draws in a row too. Because sometimes we get early concedes from the opponents that's, that are like, the game lasts one or two turns. Those example hands are important in, in my mind, so... All right, guys, I'll go ahead and pause the recording again. I, I love this pause button, though. All right, it's back to us again. <laughs> I don't think the opponent is here. And uh, I'm assuming after the next timeout, it just ends up ending. I always give benefit of the doubt to the opponents. You know, sometimes the games freeze. Or sometimes when you're like searching for a match, it like all of a sudden takes over a minute and you're like, huh, this is a little strange. And then if you like reboot the game, all of a sudden you're like in a game and it's like, how long was I in this game? You know? Sometimes glitches and stuff happen. Either way, I don't think the opponent is here. So, oh, pause it again. You never know. They might show up, huh? They did not show up. <laughs> uh, GG opponent. Well, yeah, like I said, good example hand there. I think it was solid. A little bit of ramp off Celestis and everything. I think, like, we were going to do relatively good, man. What we got here? What do we got? Stoke the Flames! Let's go, dude. Oh, I gotta play with more Stoke the Flames. When that card released, I was I was way too hyped about it. It's really good, too. It's kind of underplayed right now, isn't it? What have I been doing? How come I haven't been putting Stoke the Flames in some of my builds? Now that I'm thinking about it, it definitely belongs somewhere in one of my recent builds. Ah, oh, see? No black sources again. All those dual land packed in. 
How many black sources do we have in the mana base? Opponent goes first. You know what? I'm going to give it a shot again, guys. <laughs> yeah, the last hand was so much better. It's too bad we weren't able to play out that game. Okay, another red source. That's fine. I mean, the deck is obviously heavily leaning towards red anyways, so... Oh, there we go. Very nice. Okay, Charming Scoundrel is probably out of here. We go a couple turns of invasion. I am going to go a couple turns of invasion, actually. Instead of letting them just burn our one creature that could potentially survive next turn and swing at the invasion. A uh, couple turns of four damage to the opponent's face seems totally fine, man. We might use Charming Scoundrel's ramp. We'll have three mana next turn, four off the treasure. We're getting closer and closer to the tyrant. Well, there's all the mana we need in hand if we go treasure onto Scoundrel. Huh. I mean, invasion can help us flip that next turn too. Okay. We could go Scoundrel, treasure token, swing Scoundrel. And depending on what happens here, maybe we flip the invasion. Maybe. Let's see what they do to the scoundrel. Okay. What do you guys suppose? Ramp for next turn. Four or five. We still need a couple turns. Now, this is fine. Let's flip that invasion, dude. Let's flip it. Tyrant, Tyrant, submit to, four damage to you. With their battlefield forge and everything, I do wonder what kind of removal this could be. You know, three mana open, maybe it was just like a Seat of the Empire or something. Union of the Third Path. Oh, that is not what I was expecting at all based on the mountains, but okay. Maybe Boros midrange, huh? Boros control. I, I guess with Union of the Third Path, it would probably be Boros Control at that point. So, probably lots of spot removal. Yeah, they're looking at that Thunder Ma. If they end up letting us keep it, that could be very dangerous. Oh, Godric. Um, Godric is solid, man, but we don't have the celebration for the turn. It's still worth playing, I would say. Uh... Full swing at base might be more effective than flipping because of potential board wipes, right? So if we go Godric to invasion, flip the uh, Thunder Maw too soon. I'm going to go full to face here, guys. It might seem a little silly, but now that we think we're playing against Boros Control, uh, I think we have to play around board wipes, and if we lose all three of these creatures plus the other Thunder Maw that we flip for the turn. It's less damage at the opponent. Also, Wandering Emperor exists in these style builds too. Big score, ditching a Crucible, two mana available still off the big score's treasures. So you just like good damage to the opponent's face too? Like, yeah, that's totally fine. Like Charming Scoundrel off the top would just end this game. So they need some form of board wipe could potentially be like farewell now that they ramped off the treasures brotherhood's end doesn't hit the thunder ma <gasps> doubling down play with fire okay boros burn the union of the third path is throwing me off big time so it ended up being that board wipe that i feared so good thing we didn't end up flipping the invasion uh decadent dragon isn't bad i should not have played that land guys but it's as long as they remain exiled, so let's see what we see. Overplaying just another dragon, letting them drop a, any spot removal. I, I think seeing a couple cards off the top just seem a little bit better here. Surge of Salvation. <laughs> Dude, nice. I was not expecting that at all. We just lost the Decadent Dragon into the grave because it fizzled out. <gasps> we don't have double black for the Junji. Oh no, guys, this one's really not lining up well. That Surge of Salvation play was wild from the opponent, dude. Oh crap. Oh crap. We are going way too slow right now. 
to be up against a deck like this. Sacred Fire, sure, sure. I mean, Boros, like Sacred Fire Union, are, it's both gaining life here. Tyrant number one, is it four damage to face or four damage to invasion? Four damage to face, right? Flipping the invasion should be final priority, unless we see an opening. I, I think that's fine. Sacred Fire, back up to 11. Since we have a couple turns in a row of the Tyrant of Fear Ridges, yeah, just, just smacking face seems much, much better. On it passing, Realm Scorcher is decent, dude. The haste is really good. Um, Now flipping could be fine, but I think we just continue. We continue forward. Smack face. Uh, should we have attacked first? Uh, they knew we had the Tyrant. Yeah, I guess we should have attacked first, but Seat of the Empire and stuff doesn't get around this anyways. Yeah, skipping out on the invasion, just continue to smack the opponent's face here. Destroy evil. Nice. Okay. Opponent's still chilling at seven. We do have eight, though, next turn if they don't get rid of this Tyrant or have spot removal for, like, the Realm Scorcher when it comes down. Okay, Tyrant's gone. They get a potential chump blocker on the ground, which doesn't matter too much here. There's the double black source for the Junji. There we go, guys. Okay. Realm Scorcher, no bargain. We're going for the swings. Going for the opponent's face. Lots of removal from the opponent this game. But we're, again, we're skipping out on that invasion. Especially since we don't want to take any extra turns. It would still take two turns to flip that regardless, so... On it down to three. Arcane Bombardment. <laughs> oh my. That's at the end of their turn, right? Oh no. No, no, no. Yeah, Arcade Bombardment's whenever they play a sorcery. So they got the Union of the Third Path there. So they only gained one. So we got a little lucky. We got we got a little lucky on their hit, guys, because they could have hit like a Sunfall or something. GG opponent. Yeah, we just swing at the opponent's face there. So keeping the pressure on the opponent's face was, I, I think that was the best bet, right? I think that was doing the most for us there. Very cool deck opponent. Very, very cool. Like, super off meta. It's been so long since I played Arcade Bombardment that I literally thought it was just going to activate at the end of the turn, but it's it's whenever they play like an instant or sorcery or whatever. Dude, we got to return to that card at some point, man. If you guys are interested in some kind of Arcade Bombardment build, let me know in the comments and then we'll we'll try to prioritize that a little bit, right? Speaking of like prioritizing suggestions and whatnot, uh, that, that's a great place for the the Patreon, right? So if you ever consider joining the Patreon and supporting the channel that way, I, I consider that one of the main benefits, right? Being able to drop your suggestion in the special uh, Patreon Discord suggestion section, and then I prioritize those. I, I consider that the main benefit of it. Um, Right. Best hand of the evening, right? Outside that one where the opponent wasn't there. Like, just actually having stuff to do. Actually having the mana we need, right? We might need more black sources in the deck, surprisingly. I, I thought we were going to find a lot more than what we've been seeing. Alright, I'm going to keep Torch to the Tower open just in case. I was going to say no reason not to go Haunted Ridge based on their play, but I don't know, man. The opponent's deck surprised us last game, so this might not be five-color combo. We will see, huh? Up the beanstalk. Five color combo. No, I'm just teasing. It still might be something different. <laughs> um, Treasure on the scoundrel still seems like the best bet, huh? Yeah. Just that, just that turn two ramp. Also have Torch the Tower available, but... I don't know if that's what we end up doing here. Up the beanstalk number two. Okay. Having two of them in there might mean it's not the combo build, but it also might just be the combo build. 
it could be five color reanimator instead of combo right like it doesn't have to like we still see five color outside of the combo it's just that the combo is new and shiny and sparkly so that's what I, that's why that's what i expect from people then right decadent dragon could come down we don't get the swing this turn seeing cards off the top could be really good though we could also go invasion we we could have gone invasion no yeah no i i just i'm playing it get some treasures back down onto this board and i also want to play with like what i consider the main dragon of the deck to be so ley line binding crap no i should have anticipated that right away they get to restock their hand with up the beanstalk they get draw two and the beautiful exile there so invasion of tark here maybe was the play last time heard migration what do they need here red source no they have red on proving ground I go for the planes gonna keep crucible back all right we're gonna try first we're gonna go first devastator for one and we're gonna reveal both of them submit two get some damage through then we're gonna be a little ridiculous here we're gonna go devastator for one over keeping like towards the tower or something open get that down to three and then devastator for three and then have these two like if they wipe the board we have devastator for three in air to flip the invasion next turn gonna keep all four open huh their hand is so stocked up dude okay to have crucible open if we want to do that instead of the uh devastator which could be fine this is another game too well while we have that invasion maybe that really should have been a it's if it's spot removal crucible's better than the devastator because we go full swing and if it's a spot removal for oh it's not <laughs> well that's fine too right Get that Thunder Maw down and hope that they don't go Sunfall for this turn. If it is Sunfall, then it might just be regular, like, five color attracts it. Like, skip the combo. Just going for it, you know what I mean? Oh, farewell. That's worse than a Sunfall. Eh? I mean, it does, like, the same thing for our current setup, but dang, dude. Oh, my goodness. And they drew two off the up the Beanstalk. How brutal. <laughs> How brutal are some people's decks, man? Oh, jeez. All right, well, let's go ahead. Shivan Devastator. There's a small chance, but I don't think so. I, I think them keeping their hand super stocked. Okay, Stomper. Yeah, it's not the combo deck. See, I'm just being silly over here, man. Every five color deck I see, I'm like, oh, Invasion of Alara. But no, it's just five color. That explains the double up the beanstalk then. Uh, tapped land okay virtue of persistence not doing too much towards the tower not doing too much this early removal is realistically only great against like aggro decks which we do see a lot of aggro so the stomper can start swinging next turn let's see if we get this damage through we do not leyline binding number two draw two off the top there is like how much time We're, we are 33 minutes in I think there's not a huge chance. We're going to go one more draw, give it to them, unless they can prove that they can deal 20 damage in the next couple turns here, right? Because I, I don't want to drag you guys through a miserable game if they're just going to be swinging Stomper for five turns in a row. Because <laughs> that would be a very slow way to uh, wrap this up. We might double down, like we'd be able to double down with Virtue and Torch if it was just the Stomper too. Oh, there they go, there they go. Oh, what a sick addition to an up the beanstalk deck. Tyrannix Rex. That's what I'm talking about, opponent. That's how to wrap it up, huh? So 12 through. We're going to get that one more draw, and then we'll actually be able to let them swing on in, too. Four poison counters. My turn. If we see land, yeah, there we go. We can take out the stomper. Uh, we still will have to block the Rex, so if they go Leyline Binding number three, then that's that. It could easily be Leyline Binding number three. And up the Beanstalk really showing off 
just how powerful it can actually be in a build like this, especially with Leyline Binding. A domain just being terrific recently, huh? Oh, Rex number two, you don't even need... <laughs> you don't even need removal, man. Oh, very uh, cool five color list opponent. When I was over here thinking it was just the combo build, and then you're rocking freaking Tyrannix Rex. You're rocking five color dinosaurs, dude. All right. Hey, the opponents have really been bringing some fun stuff to the table, honestly. But let's see, 35 minutes in, we have time for one more. Let's do this. Yeah, I was expecting a little more from the build overall. I, I wasn't expecting it to need to line up so well, but it really feels like it's having to line up perfectly. Huh? I, I thought it was going to be a little bit more... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, I guess consistent, like across the board. Even like with a bad hand, I expected a little more consistency. So really might come down to what we're seeing in these particular matches, right? Like if we saw aggro in that last game, maybe that hand would have been a little better overall. And Virtue of Persistence not showing off a whole lot in these games either, where we've actually just, in a lot of those games, go for the throat would have just been much better. All right, we'll give this a shot with 25 total land. Oh, hello, opponent. 25 total land, I think we'll see our third, which will be important unless we just go treasure for scoundrel. Hey, we asked to go up against aggro. Here we go, man. Let's get that treasure token down. Make sure we have our third in case we don't see the mana off the top. I'll swing over a chump for next turn because if they play like Feldon, there's not going to be a lot of great chumps anyways. Like we wouldn't want to chump that gonna be a swift spear okay uh play with fire face for maximum damage instead of the scoundrel i i don't think they fear that scoundrel or commando that works too I, I was thinking burn for the turn but so we have our third ripa's blocks well enough i would say there's a there's a third outside of that virtue while we can gain two sounds good blocking commando it just isn't great Okay, virtue while we can, right? Land while we can, because seeing more land off the top is totally fine too. And I'm not going to save anything back to block the Kamano. Because we might actually be able to outpace this. Double Godric isn't terrific, but you never know. If we can get the Devastator above Mono Red's burn and just like able to block whatever we want, then that would be really good. Swing in for four. So a chump on the etching. Eh. It could have been good. We'll have the chump next turn, though. Or maybe we they sink some burn into that instead. Five mana total. So if we go uh, X is four, it could still likely die. So it's probably Rivas for the turn. And keep blockers back. And hopefully the Rivas can actually get this Devastator down successfully. Uh oh, I don't know about that, though. Commando flips. Lightning Strike is all over these mono red builds. Yeah, Lightning Strike. Okay, so if it was Godric instead, so Shivon Devastator could have been a 4 4. That would have survived. We do have the Chump for the turn. With Riva gone, land off the top for Devastator is 5 could be good. Oh my goodness, we are going to melt. We are melting, guys. <laughs> we are taking 6 damage from this board state. Invasion of Bragatha just. Cleaning this up, dude. Oh, that is actually good, but we're just too low now, unfortunately. So if we go Godric block on the ground, they still have Phoenix Chick in the air. We'd go Devastator for two. Godric's legendary, so we can't double down on that. If we do this for five, then four gets through on a full swing. So the only chance of survival is Godric and Shivon Devastator X's two. So we, we can block in the air. Uh, thank you, opponent. <laughs> we can't swing, though. No vigilance. It could just be another invasion of Regatha. Or a lightning strike. Oh, we might actually be alive for the turn here. I guess the Phoenix Chick is the better block, even though they can eventually bring it back we just don't have a guarantee other like we have a blocker on the ground here but we don't have 
another blocker in the air for the Phoenix Chick for the turn. Oh, I guess their last card is going to clean this up too. <laughs> Good game opponent. A ton of burn there. Uh, the double lightning strike. So the biggest blunder that I think I did that game was risk the... Uh, we knew that lightning strike was likely i'd say like usually if it feels like lightning strike it is lightning strike right and i played the rivals of the claw down right into it uh so that was pretty bad i think the shivan devastator as a 4-4 would have been a little better but as we saw from what the opponent ended up having they could have eventually just doubled down on that anyways or if we blocked the phoenix chick just also go play with fire sure they would have lost two cards to our one but it was still looking really really good for them and then the invasion of regatha was disgusting that game dude very very clean plays from the opponent and a good game overall i'd say we, we were on the run man rakdos dragons okay i have a thing or two to say about this man i thought it was gonna be good <laughs> we did not really showcase it being good did we so i would put this of course on the do not craft list it seemed relatively janky in those games i don't realistically know what we could possibly do to make it a little bit better um, I guess first things first, you know, I bring it up a thousand times in these videos. Your choice spot removal might instantly rip this out of the jank zone. You never know. Virtual persistence didn't seem to do too much. Although in that last game, the life gain was nice, but they were just piling way too much damage through anyways. Like it landed in that last game, but in most of those games, just a simple go for the throat would have been much better, right? I thought sometimes we'd actually get to the seven mana too with all the ramp and the 25 land, but nah. Uh, the games were over before we hit 7 mana in most of those, right? While we were able to pack a decent amount of damage through, the deck just seemed a little bit too slow for what we're seeing in Standard, and another thing we're seeing in Standard is just way too much removal, and so we didn't really get to do anything with our Decadent Dragon either. You know, it not having haste does hold it back a fair bit, and so maybe having cards in here that could give it haste, but well, we gotta try Decadent Dragon out at some point as a top end of aggro with, um... Bro, it's, it's been so long, I, I can't remember its full name right now. Uh, Reckless Storm Seeker. Yes, dude. Okay, <laughs> like, I have these on three. <laughs> all four of them on three, and then all four of the Decadent Dragons on four. We got to try that in an aggro build at some point. I guess that would be just Rakdos aggro. That way we could at least have the black mana in there for the Expensive Taste, which Expensive Taste had a chance of doing a lot more. Uh, in this build if we would have seen a little bit better but it's only two cards it's not like you're seeing the top 10 cards of the opponent's deck and then you choose to now nah, it's just two cards so you'd have to get pretty lucky to hit exactly what you're looking for from the opponent too like when we were searching for the go for the throat for the obliterator for example right other than that dude just like the overwhelming amount of flying power in the build i mean obviously it's dragons we're flying in swinging good damage there was probably a lot of instances where i could have played things out a little bit better too uh there were some instances where the torch the tower did absolutely nothing and so like play with fires might be a little better that way we can at the very least target anything including our battles right so our battle siege the invasion of tarkir and that comes down to again your choice spot removal right so that's probably what i would end up doing so to recap I, you know, put it on the do not craft list. If I were to update this lift, list, I would go go for the throats instead of Virtue of Persistence, just based on what we saw today. And I would drop Torch the Towers for two Play with Fires again, just based on what we saw today. Uh, and that might increase the consistency a little bit. And then I would probably drop one Godric. I think two is totally fine. And go up another piece of ramp, probably. What, what should that ramp be? honestly dude it felt like we didn't have enough black sources in here but that's a lot of dual land and mirex and the swamp and the abandoned mire and we're heavily heavily leaning towards red anyways it still felt like we just didn't have enough enough black sources in here so maybe i would drop that godric for a second celestis maybe maybe especially since we won't have the life gain on virtue of persistence if we change that out for go for the throat then at least we have the life gain on celestis a little bit of filtering too i mean that filtering really really goes a long way interesting yeah i'm, I'm looking at it i'm like oh yeah you, you'd think like it would do a lot more unfortunately rivas just has way too big of a target on his back dude uh were we ever able to actually keep this on the board no i don't i don't think we were right yeah we never successfully used that ability 
Since we can't use that ability with the Godric, that's another reason to drop that one Godric too. So potentially to increase consistency, you would drop a Godric, trade out Virtues for uh, your choice spot removal, probably go for the throws, trade out towards the tower for something that can actually hit the Invasion of Tarkir, probably play with Fire, right? And then with that one Godric that you drop, go up just something else to help you feel more consistent, which might be that second Celestis, but probably a couple other picks that you could choose as well. Or something that gives haste to, actually, you know what? I mean, one of my favorite red cards, dude, Bitter Reunion. Yeah, I could totally see that as a one of in here, or a two of for that matter. It's beautiful, dude. Being able to, uh, I mean, you could send stuff to the grave and eventually bring it back with the Rivas too, and the Junji. You know what? Yeah, maybe a couple of these. I don't, I don't know though. <laughs> I'd say overall more testing required too, but. Guys, if you made it this far into the video, y'all are champions for real. Make sure you let me know what you would add or take out down in the comments. And uh, yeah, I think, oh, thanks again for the suggestion to play with Rivas again. It, it is a fun card. It's too bad we weren't actually able to keep it on the board in any of those games. Opponent's decks just look so scary on so many levels, dude. <laughs> Anyways, guys, hey, uh, thanks again for being here. And I will see you in the next video.